Hey everybody, so I guess we'll get started because uh, we're going to be, we went 15 minutes over at, De at Black Hat when we had a lot more time, so uh, can you guys hear us okay? Hear me okay? I'm sorry, I've been in Vegas since Tuesday and I already sound like Kathleen Turner from all the smoke. Um, so my name is Alex Damos, uh, this is Chris Palmer and Chris Ritter, uh, and we're here to talk about uh, the security of computer forensic software um, and things to be concerned about if you use it and perhaps things to be uh, interested in if you think it will be used against you. Um, so we'll do a little introduction about this stuff, talk about the attack surfaces uh, for computer forensic software, attack classes, some bug finding techniques that we've used over the last couple months to find what we think are some interesting bugs. Um, we're going to talk about the Sleuth Kit, which is uh, probably the premier open source forensic toolkit out there uh, by Brian Carrier. Is Brian here? He shows up every once in a while. No? Um, and then we're going to talk about issues with uh, guidance and case forensic and guidance and case enterprise, um, some conclusions. And then at the end, we have an extra special bonus talk uh, by Chris Ritter, who's a fellow at the Stanford Law School Center for Information, uh, uh, Information Society? Internet. Internet and Society. Right, so he works with Jennifer Granick, and uh, he's done some interesting research into the impact security issues might have into the admissibility of evidence and the use of evidence. So kind of before we get started, it'd be interesting to see what the audience is like. Who here has ever used forensic software at all to do forensics? Okay, wow. Who here has used Guidance Encase? Any addition? Who here has used Encase Enterprise? Wow, pretty good number. Who here has used the Sleuth Kit? Okay. And who here thinks they have a reasonable expectation that Encase will eventually be used on their hard drive? <laughs> okay. So you can go introduce yourselves, shake hands. <laughs> um, so who are we? So uh, Chris Palmer and I are researchers and consultants of a company called ISEC Partners, a little company we started two and a half years ago out of the uh, destruction of At Stake. Um, and uh, please send us your resumes. Okay, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, we're working consultants, we're not full-time researchers, so kind of the techniques we're talking about uh, came from doing actual black box and gray box penetration testing of, of real world applications. Um, and we got into this because we use the sleuth, sleuth kit and Encase uh, in our day-to-day -day basis. We're not forensics experts, we don't do a lot of forensics work, but we do have clients that have come to us to do some incident response and to try to figure some things out. So we own these products and while using them, uh, we kind of switched our minds from forensic mode to software security people mode and thought, wow, these things are, are pretty crazy in what they're doing. They're, they're very, very ambitious uh, products and maybe that uh, should be looked into. Um, so as a result, we looked at the two things that we use, uh, the Sleuth Kit and Encase, uh, and we think we have found some interesting bugs. Um, you know, there can be arguments made uh, back and forth of how useful these specific bugs are. I think. The point of this talk today is about the amount of the attack surface we touched and the amount of bugs that came out of the, the attack surface we touched and what that means for the reliability of these products going forward uh, and how people should treat them. Um, we actually found our first bug in about two hours after starting fuzzing of the, the commercial product. Um, so this is definitely kind of a virgin territory. I think these products don't get looked at from a security perspective too often. Uh, I know there's been a lot of anti-forensic stuff about hiding data, playing with your uh, your timestamp, stuff like that. Uh, but there hasn't been a lot of discussion about attacking them to actually attack the forensic examiner's workstation or uh, change how data is being redisplayed. Um, or I've never seen any research about attacking the remote forensic software, which is uh, about a, a third of our talk and we'll do right at the end. So. Um, the, we've spent a lot more time on the paper than these, these slides, uh, considering some of these slides were written about 12 minutes ago. So I strongly recommend that you download our paper. Uh, it was co-authored by Jesse Burns and Tim Newsham of ISEC Partners, and they did a ton of work, and we're very grateful to them. Um, but Jesse went home, and Tim prefers surfing to Vegas, so he's not here. But if you go to ISECPartners.com, you can download the paper. And tonight, we're going to upload a big like 16 megabyte tar file of all of the file system fuzzing tools that we created. A uh, bunch of Python scripts, some fun stuff. So if you guys want to do your own investigation, it might actually be useful if you want to attack uh, file system drivers uh, and operating systems as well. Uh, but if you want to look at forensic software, please uh, take a look and be responsible in your disclosure. Okay, so what is interesting about forensic software? So the kind of the interesting thing that we don't have a slide about because it's so obvious is it's really important, right? Um, 
For computer forensic software, you know, the, the, the small number of products that are used have almost a court-enforced monopoly because the, the ones that get used over and over again get accepted by courts over and over again. And so there's a small group of pieces of software that are extraordinarily important. And there's a lot of people sitting in jail today because those products work, right? And we're not up here saying that these products don't work. They generally, the vast majority of the time, work, right? And, and the vast majority of the evidence that pops out of them is probably very accurate. Um, what we're talking about is the corner cases, right, which is whenever you're talking about security. Um, one of the other interesting things about these products is the attack surface. The attack surface on NCASE Forensic is absolutely stunning when you think about the percentage of code that is doing dangerous parsing against attacker-controlled data. And when we talk about attacker-controlled data, you're talking about somebody who is generally either, who's either being sued in a civil case or who's suspected of being a criminal by the criminal justice system, right? So. You're already talking about kind of a population of not nice people, perhaps. Um, you know, this, this product doesn't load up generally the hard drives of, of, of fourth graders. Um, it's used on people that maybe know and want to do some bad things. Um, and if you think about, you know, Microsoft Word does a couple different file formats, but they're one major file format that Microsoft invented. They've had, what, six, seven remotely exploitable buffer overflows from one file format. Um, NCASE Forensic, it claims to be able to read something like eight or ten different file systems, and over 270 different file types can be displayed within the application. Um, and I, I leave it as a challenge for you to try to write something that parses 270 file types in C++ uh, securely. That is not an easy thing to do, uh, as, as we'll see. So, um, the attack surface is huge. Uh, the attack surface in some of these cases is automatically uh, looked at by the product. If you look at a file system, obviously a lot of the file system structures will be parsed automatically. Um, and then products like, you know, the sleuth kit's a lot less ambitious, but a product like NCASE, you can click a lot of buttons and it goes and does all your work for you. It automatically finds exchange databases. It automatically finds Outlook files, PSTs. Um, it automatically goes and finds your Thunderbird mail spool. That's the kind of stuff that automatically can often be attacked and a person doesn't have to actually go and look at an image. Um, so we'll talk about kind of the, the different classes of attack and what it means for forensic software. So um, evidence hiding is an obvious one. If you can do something to a hard drive to make it so that a normal user with their operating system sees and uses a bunch of data and that is invisible to the examiner, that's kind of a big deal, right? Now that's not a big deal that you can use to frame somebody else, but it's certainly something that these products don't want to have because if you're you know, a police officer, you don't want to get tricked like that in some kind of embarrassing, easy way. Now, that's something that can be worked around by using multiple products, um, but I think, you know, if every forensic examiner used three products to look at every hard drive they look at, uh, there'd be a lot less uh, caseload, and, you know, forensic examiners would have, have to be about three times as many, right? Um, so that's kind of a big deal. Code execution. So um, I'm going to make this clear because this is something that we've been misquoted by journalists in the past. We are not claiming arbitrary code execution. We are claiming that we have found a lot of memory corruption bugs, in some cases controlling certain things like EIP. Whether or not that is exploitable is a, 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 a mental exercise for the listener. Um, because when people claim exploitability and you don't have a working exploit, uh, you know, it, it gets kind of a big fight in the, in, in the media and the actual message would get overturned. And since we've had a little bit of a contentious relationship with guidance so far, uh, we don't want to get stuck on little stupid things like that. Um, so we didn't write any exploit code. We're not releasing any exploit code. Um, but these bugs, as you'll see, uh, control some very interesting parts of memory. Um, and therefore, if people spend a lot of time, I think our evidence supports the idea that these products probably have a decent number of, of code execution vulnerabilities in them. Um, and people need to prepare for that from a protection standpoint, and they need to prepare for it from a legal standpoint. And then denial of service. Um, there's a lot of bugs you can do to make these things just kind of either not be able to look at your hard drive, crash all the time, hang all the time. Um, you know, these, that happens sometimes with these products on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. Um, and uh, if you're an attacker could do, make it happen over and over again, you might be able to get away with something. You might be able to make their life hard. Um, you might just want to be a jerk, right? So, um, you know, I'm not sure what the actual impact of denial of service would be, although a lot of those denial of service bugs, if you kind of look at them, maybe they become exploitable in the end. Um, so, you know, a couple techniques that you can use for finding this stuff. Um, there's the dumb old way, random fuzzing. Uh, it's not sexy. Uh, we're not going to say that it's like some kind of super elite uh, attack technique. Unfortunately, it works really, really well um, against these products. Uh, and you can use our tools to do things like generate a file system, put a bunch of PDFs on them, put a bunch of exchange databases on them, and then fuzz both the files without touching the file system, or you can fuzz the file system and mess up things like file system structures, obviously attacking totally different parts of the code. Um, 
And then you can do a lot of targeted manually, manual mingling of things. Uh, you know, as a human being, it's sometimes a lot easier to figure out something that would kind of trip up these products uh, as a human being and think, oh, this is something that would be hard for me to code around if I had to build the product. Um, and so we did a lot of that too. And so Chris is going to talk about some of the individual bugs. Cool. Okay, hi, I'm Chris. So um, there's the slides detail a bunch of different bugs, and we don't have a whole ton of time. So I'm going to be skipping a lot of them and just jumping to the funny, cool ones or, uh, you know, glossing them over. But again, visit the paper and all the details are there. So our fuzzer just does some kind of obvious stuff. And um, again, this shouldn't have produced much in the way of results, but even in 2007, a random number generator can cause tons of trouble, and that's kind of sad. Um, but that's where we are. So, you know, we, we picked just some of the obvious targets, you know, the most common file systems, most common document types. And again, we've only just barely scratched the huge attack surface of these products. So who knows what else lurks. Um, also, in addition to the random fuzzing, we did do some, as Alex was saying, some, uh, some manual, you know, targeted manipulation, things that would seem like as a, as a developer, you'd think, well, where would I go wrong if I were trying to understand NTFS? You know, so we tried to, like, see if uh, the developers of the products had gone wrong there. And in some cases, they did. Uh, the usual stuff, make a super long file, super deeply nested directories. And that one happens to be a particularly good one or funny one. So first, the Sleuth Kit by Brian Carrier. It's open source, uh, wonderful. That helped us do better, what we think is much better testing. Um, the availability of code lets us see exactly what code is going wrong. We were even able to uh, patch over the first round of bugs and then find more deeply hidden bugs. When you're doing this kind of random fuzzing, you'll often just hit a bug and there may be a, a a, a bug that the first bug is hiding. And so with having code, we were able to dig a little deeper than we were with proprietary product. So um, SleuthKit works in a Unixy way. There's just a million little programs each do one thing to or with a file system image. And then you're, it's up to you to script the pieces together and make something useful out of it. So it's, it's nerdy. Um, and we found problems in four of the 23. Um, nothing new in this slide that you've already seen, but uh, the defects are crashes and strange parsing of data structures. So here's, a, here's an obvious one. Hopefully everyone can see what's wrong in this code, and I made it easy by making the code red. So um, easy fix, simple problem, but it just causes a crash, um, depending on your allocator, and most allocators these days probably wouldn't like that too well. Dereferencing memory after it's been freed um, let's see, I'm going to skip to a particularly fun one. Here's one. So again, we see the code has some defense against a possible problem. Um, it uh, checks to, in that top of that while loop, it makes sure that the FS data run pointer is valid, not null. But it gets changed before the check is rerun. And at the bottom, we may be dereferencing a null pointer or an otherwise bad pointer. Um, let's, this one might be, this one's kind of complicated. There's a side effect happening on that IDXE. Um, but the point, a good point to make here is these functions like get u48, get u16, get u32, they um, read the file system, which again is attacker controlled data, 10 gigabytes of potentially malicious stuff. And it um, reads that user data turns it into a 16-bit or 48-bit or 32-bit number, and then uses it as an offset or a pointer or some other value that controls how the application is going to do its job without checking for things like, does this pointer point anywhere sane? Um, do we have, are we looking for the 10 millionth item in a list of 100 items, that kind of thing? A lot of problems like that where there's a lot of trust in the file system, which of course is misplaced. Let's see, I want to skip ahead since I've only got a few minutes. But these are all along the same lines. Lots of crashes, bad pointers that go nowhere. 
um, denying service infinite loops due to uh, strange integers that go wrong. But let's move on to Encase, a proprietary product for Windows, and it's th pretty much the opposite of the sleuth kit. It's Windowsy, right? It has a specific, I'm sorry, a sophisticated user interface, and it integrates all the features that you would want. It can handle different file systems. It can handle different um, data types, and it can even, you know, disp as again, you all have seen in case lots of hands went up. It'll show you the data right in a little view pane. You can get a hex view or a document view or all sorts of nice stuff. So it does have some programmability, of course. It's got its own built-in language called Enscript. So it's very different than the SleuthKit approach, as well as in its uh, opaqueness. In addition to being proprietary, it's also packed or uh, pseudo-encrypted. And there's some uh, relatively simple um, anti-debugging mechanisms in there to further annoy us. But we just attached WinDebug after it starts, and then it doesn't seem to mind that too well. So, or it doesn't seem to mind that. So we were still able to do things, you know, use WinDebug to hand, uh, an analyze in case. Um, and then, of course, there's also a copy protection dongle, which is kind of infuriating. Um, so we we don't we don't we, we didn't get to do the um, we only hit the first layer of bugs with our random fuzzing because we couldn't patch the ones we found and then see what else is there. But um, so who knows what else lurks? Um, so in case can't handle things like mangled uh, partition tables, it will fail to acquire the drive. For example, um, here's an example with a uh, partition number 29 is just completely wrong. It's the same size as the others, but it's starting end offsets are completely crazy. And that makes in case not be able to acquire this drive at all. Um, let's, oh yeah, oh, that's actually a good point. Thank you, Alex. Um, in this case, the partition table, this is when we feed the image to Encase running on a Windows machine from a Linux machine running a little program called Linen, which is an Encase tool to, it's kind of like your, what you'd think of if you were using uh, SleuthKit or for just Unix stuff, you would use DD and Netcat to feed the raw device to another server to, uh, to read. So it's kind of like, it's doing basically that, although it's its, its own thing. And uh, so we found that uh, Linen itself behaves differently depending on whether you corrupt this partition table before linen is started and has begun reading or after and it makes in case um, hang and be uh, it's in case has different failure modes depending on when the corruption happens but we didn't really look into linen much at all we just sort of noted that issue and then moved on but uh, linen is its own thing so there's going to be a lot of bugs like this where if you mangle an NTFS image in case can't handle it in various ways. NTFS is just a rather, as file systems go, it's among the more insane. It's extremely tricky. And in this case, what we'll see here is that, uh, so in, in the master file table, which is a NTFS data structure, um, it has different entries of arbitrary size and number for different attributes of a file. And uh, we just poked one. There's a file record. Normally, it would be zero, where it says 61 in red. But our fuzzer happened to put 61 there one time in a file record. And what we'll see, oh, I'm so sorry. This is so tiny. Um, my laser pointer probably can't even do. Right around here, I think it's EDI. I can't read it either. And my computer has an extremely different tiny view. EDI contains in it the base of uh, an allocated region in which the file record will go. And our number is uh, 6130 is used as an offset into that region, which is completely wrong. It's, uh, it, it, uh, what we get is a, uh, a read access violation because that number is way too big for the region and it points nowhere, and so in case crashes. But so the point is that uh, attacker controlled data causes a pointer dereference that's wrong and in case dies and we get wind debug. Um, so a lot of the bugs are along those lines. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to some, this is a good one. Okay, so 
NTFS, being the crazy complicated thing that it is, le lends itself to problems like this, where different interpreters of it interpret the same structure differently. And we found that the Linux uh, NTFS 3G driver handles a directory loop in a way that's different than the way in case handles it. So what we did is we manually created a directory loop. Um, we had a, a file that said that it was its own parent, which of course is completely silly. So what we did is we just manually did that. That's not the result of uh, random fuzzing. So what in this, this hex dump shows a part of an MFT entry for a file called readme.txt. The blue areas refer to, um, for example, there's the where, what's the file reference, what's the uh, size, actual and, and real, and what are the flags that uh, describe this file. And we just manually change them to those of the parent directory. With, um, and that, the, the red bits is what we changed. And again, our paper, if you can't read it because it's too small or too strange, the paper covers it in good enough detail. So we feed this um, file system that contains a directory loop to Linux and in case. And, um, oh, that's, I'm skipped ahead, sorry. So what we found is that um, in case shows the file itself and doesn't show the directory loop, but it fails to show other files that were in the same directory as the file that is a loop to its parent. Whereas Linux shows us just a regular directory loop. So this uh, allows uh, a bad guy to potentially use data in uh, Linux that in case will later ignore when the image is analyzed by in case. Um, so, and I don't really have, I can't even speculate as to how, if I were a developer on in case, how I would even approach that. Because again, NTFS is very frightening and I'm scared. Um, and here's a good one. This one will show EIP belongs to us, but in a sadly um, unamusing way. It's uh, not particularly uh, exploity, but it's uh, definitely suggestive. So what we did is we created, um, again, manually, just a super deeply nested directory structure. You know, there's like maybe a thousand children. Um, and what we found is that you don't get this problem if the children have multiple siblings. It has to be a directory contains one directory, contains one directory, contains one directory for a long time. And we think that the reason that bug happens only when, when there's only one child per is uh, uh, an optimization to avoid recursion. But the result is that EIP becomes controlled by the number, or partly controlled, I should say, by the number of nested things. And as you can see here, uh, if you have supervision, which I don't, but if you have this, uh, the paper, Again, isecpartners.com slash black hat. You'll see that EIP is uh, CA in hexadecimal. Too low to point to um, any code at all, let alone attacker's code. But of course, it does cause a crash because there's no reasonable code there at all. But the point is, um, a bad file system image allowed the attacker to control the instruction pointer, which seems not totally great. Um, oh, and then here's a simple one. If you make a disk image with too many partitions, um, and you can see here we made a disk image in Linux that has like I think 51 partitions. In case, just doesn't like that. It will show us up to number 25 and then it stops. So if you want to hide your porn, put it on partition 26. <laughs> Um, but, oh, and we should mention that uh, the bugs that I've listed so far, guidance tells us that they are going to be fixed in the next release, which will be release 6.7. So that's good news. Uh, these particular bugs, although Alex is going to talk about a different kind of bug, a uh, protocol bug, that um, probably will take longer to fix. Um, how am I for time? Yeah, okay, great. I'm going to hand it over to Alex, but there um, exist more entertaining bugs for you to read in the paper. So that was kind of just a, a bit, 
a snapshot of some of the bugs we talked about in the paper, and the paper is a snapshot of the bugs we generated. Um, when you do testing like this, the hard part is not generating the flaws, it's uh, doing the analysis, right? It's real easy to automate the fuzzing, it's easy to, um, Chris actually worked up a really cool, using a thing called, anybody here use PyWin Auto before? There's a, there's a, a Windows subsystem called Windows Automation that allows you to automate and click a lot of buttons automatically. And Chris worked up like a really cool Python script that would go and have in case do the acquisitions automatically and stuff like that. So with a non-command uh, uh, line tool, you often have to do things like that to generate the bugs. The problem is there's really no good way of automating the analysis. And a lot of the times when you do this kind of thing, like Chris said, we'll have huge stack of WinDebug mini dumps that come out of, the, out of our tools that all point to the same flaw expressed in different ways that maybe different EIPs or different memory because things slightly were different on the way there. Um, so anyway, that was a little little slice of, of issues in those two products. Um, and then the, the sleuth kit bugs have been fixed. They were fixed in version 2.0.9. They're actually fixed within like three days or something like that. Um, you can draw your own conclusions of open source versus commercial software. It was like a week. Oh, it took them a whole week. Yeah. So anyway. Um, so we had a lot of people here who used NCase Enterprise. Um, this is the, the big, probably the big money maker for guidance. It's the much more expensive version. Um, NCase, the version of NCase Forensic we own costs about $6,000. And um, we have clients that own NCase Enterprise, uh, and their installs are in the $125,000 to $250,000 range. Um, now, companies are willing to pay that because they find NCase Enterprise extremely convenient. Um, and it's convenient because it doesn't really add any analysis benefits. It's convenient because it allows you to remotely acquire machines for analysis, to remotely look at the processes that are running on a machine, to remotely grab the memory, and to remotely grab the hard drives of that machine, store them locally on your workstation, then do your analysis at your own time. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, if you're a big global company and you've got 50 offices around the world and your incident response and fraud and forensics team are all in New York, you really don't want to be putting them on 747s every time um, there's an incident anywhere on the planet, right? Um, it's especially true because it seems that once enterprises deploy NCase Enterprise, they're much more into phishing expeditions, that they will not wait for something that is specifically look like um, you know, somebody's committing fraud against them. If they feel something's going wrong, it's so convenient, it's not that hard to go out and pull down the whole marketing department's hard drives and look at all of them and see who the one who had the insider trading information. Um, and so that's much more convenient for them because they can, you can go investigate people without them knowing, right? You don't have to go to their cube and pull their hard drive out. Um, you don't have to have some person from a different office very mysteriously walking around, right, or being there at 3 a.m. You can just say, if their machine's on at night, boop, grab this at 3 a.m., give me their hard drive, and when I come in the morning, I've got it sitting there for analysis. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying that this is, the, this is why people are willing to pay $250,000 for this product. Um, so, would you think NCase Enterprise is only used for internal investigations? I'm guessing a significant number of those people that, rose, that raised their hands were actually law enforcement officers who use NCase Enterprise, which we were surprised about, but it does seem that NCase Enterprise is used um, sometimes because the law pushes uh, police officers to use minimally, minimally invasive techniques. Um, and it's much more minimally invasive to image somebody's drive remotely over the network than it is to go pull their hard drive out, right? Since the latter means you can't do business anymore. Um, and so I think enterprise has been used for that situation. Um, and certainly guidance puts forth in their public documentation the idea that evidence collected with NCase Enterprise alone should be good enough for civil or criminal lawsuits. In fact, they have an entire legal document written by their chief legal officer that lays out case law and a lot of justifications of why it should be good. And it turns out that courts have accepted NCase Enterprise evidence in the past, right, Chris? Yeah, so there is, there is some uh, court law, case law backing them up that you, know, that you can use NCase Enterprise to gather evidence. It's not just for internal investigations. It can be used for law enforcement. Um, and our, in our cases, actually, a couple of our clients use it to do their own internal investigation, and then they turn that data over to the U.S. attorney um, or to the local district attorney. Um, and so the, the initial analysis is done by their own people, and then later analysis is done uh, by uh, police investigators. Um, and here, of course, is a quote from them. NCase Enterprise is ideally suited to recover and authenticate data over a local or wide area network. So please remember that phrase. Okay, so should we trust the evidence gathered by NCase Enterprise? Um, NCase Enterprise contains a, a rather complex crypto system. Um, it is not extremely well documented, and this is kind of a point we want to make that for a product that's very, very important and that has sent probably a lot of people to jail, um, it seems to be the kind of thing that should be you know, the, at least the crypto system should be open bare for people to have lots of peer review, perhaps by, you know, guys like Ed Felton and Dave Wagner who love looking at that stuff for free and then writing about it on their blogs. And so, um, 
when we wanted to learn about NCASE Enterprise, uh, we can't afford a $250,000 license, um, but we did observe its use, uh, its legal license use by our customers in their enterprise environments, and then some testing during that. Our lawyer sitting in the front row, wave Joe. Um, if anybody threatens you for doing security research, I recommend hiring Kecker Van Nest of San Francisco, and especially Joe Grant. Five twenty-five an hour. You're buying lunch, bro. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, so you know, to do this kind of this kind of research is actually very difficult, right? And I think there's a lot of enterprise software out there that doesn't get good security research because 13-year-olds in the Czech Republic can't download it off BitTorrent, um, and because most uh, legitimate security research organizations like us can't afford it. Um, in this case, we were able to use it legally within our customers uh, because they're interested in the outcome themselves. Um, when we wanted to find out how the crypto system worked, there are a couple of public documents from Guidance. Um, neither one of them really lay out the crypto system in what I'd call a scientific manner, or a manner that corresponds to if you read a paper uh, in a cryptography class in college that would correspond to that. Um, actually, probably the best documentation was when we asked them, we did receive a slide deck that they give to us in sales presentations for people's security teams who ask. Uh, which was nice of them. Um, but actually the best documentation overall was their patent applications. Um, Guidance Software has been issued two patents on uh, the ability to remotely acquire network drives as well as a patent on how to do a restart um, of that acquisition. And although the patents do not specifically say this is NCASE, NCASE Enterprise Edition 6, um, it seems that the information in the patents corresponds to all the other publicly uh, available information and also corresponds to our own testing. And so we're going to use the patent applications for our cryptanalysis and for our discussion today. But I just want to kind of lay it out. Maybe this is the kind of thing that we can get a nice big academic white paper from them um, that was reviewed by, you know, in the future, people that make products like this. Um, so one of the things you do when you want to set out and build a crypto system is you have to lay out what your goals are. Right? And a lot of crypto systems are broken because the goals are incorrectly understood. Maybe you really want integrity protection and, and use a confidentiality protection. Right? Doing an RC4 uh, cipher on data does not give you integrity protection, for example, but it might give you a reasonable amount of confidentiality protection. So when we sat down and thought to ourselves, what would we want to do if we had to design a system that grabs people's hard drives with a network, we thought the things we'd want to do is authenticate what machine we're going to, keep that hard drive secret as it flies across the network, um, keep the hard drive image from being changed as it flies across the network, obviously, you don't want it changed by people, um, and authenticate and authorize the user asking for the target machine. We obviously don't want to create a back door in all of our machines that anybody can use to grab their hard drives. Um, our analysis has shown that the NCASE Enterprise system meets all of these goals except the first one the authentication of the target machine, which in our opinion is the most important, but I, I'm sure there can be reasonable discussion of whether or not that's actually the most important goal. Um, and they kind of actually almost admit to this in some of the documentation saying what the goal of the NCASE Enterprise system is mostly about user authentication. Um, so there are three components in NCASE Enterprise. There's the examiner's workstation, which is basically NCASE forensic with some other stuff wrapped around it. Um, this is where it, and a person sits down and says, I want Bob's computer .corp .bank com or an IP address. Um, there's a thing called a safe, which is a, a server that generally runs full time on a corporate network. The safe is kind of the trusted introducer. It knows who all the licensed examiners are, and um, it, it allows, it authorizes, and authenticates those examiners, and then does a trusted introduction between the examiners and the servlet. Now, they use the term servlet, which really drives us nuts because we do a lot of Java stuff. Um, it has nothing to do with Java, it's just a small program, it's like 600K. Um, it's a user mode program as well as a device driver that's blown out to people's hard drives so that you can image their hard drive, right? So um, the examiner workstation has a public-private key pair, which comes from Guidance software that's then registered with the safe. The safe has a key pair that comes from Guidance as part of a big human-in-the-middle authentication process. The servlet does not have a key pair, and that's what we're about to talk about. So can't really read these. These are screenshots from the patent, um, which our lawyer has told us we're allowed to use. Um, uh, this is the initialization of the crypto system when you do the install. This looks okay. Uh, the safe generates its own key pair, sends it to guidance. There's some kind of human in the loop situation where a human verifies that you're a licensed user and stuff. The key pair is sent back. It's stored on the safe. And then the safe rolls its own servlet. So it creates a setup.exe, which is a setup program that installs the servlet on all the targeted workstations. And that setup.exe has the public uh, key of the safe burned into it. So this is how you bootstrap trust between all of the workstations and that enterprise's NCASE server is that you push out a binary that has the key burnt into it. Um, 
when you want to do an examination, the examiner contacts the safe and says, I want to do an examination. And when it does so, uh, this actually works out pretty well. It's a, a standard kind of mutual authentication using public-private keys. You generate random numbers, you send it to each other, yada, yada, yada. The safe has a big list of who's allowed to do what. This seems to work fine. Okay, so the, the part that we are concerned about is this part. So I'm going to try to actually show this in the PDF to make it bigger. Is that at all readable, or do I have to make it bigger? Here we go. Is that, is that readable to you guys? Jeez. Better? <laughs> so our components here are the client machine, which is the examiner, the vendor who isn't involved in this transaction, the server, the safe, this is the full-time server running on the network, the key master who is like a super user who's not involved, and then the target machine, this is uh, Bob. So Alice in this example is our examiner, Bob is uh, the, the person who's being investigated, and then Malice is the person who actually committed the crime and happens to be on the same switched Ethernet network as Bob. Unfortunately for Bob. So if you look at this, actually, people that have done any crypto review, it kind of actually gets obvious what the, the issue is here. Um, the server generates a random number. It signs that random number with its private key. It sends that package to the target machine. So now the, the target machine can say, hey, that's a random number, and it came from the safe. And because it has the local public key, it can verify that signature, right? So it does so. It generates its own random key. And then it sends the, its random key and the original random key encrypted with the safe's public key here. A couple other things happen. This creates a, a one-time session key for AES symmetric encryption and sends it and it encrypts it with this random key here. What's missing from this handshake? I'm sorry? Authentication, Authentication of what? Of the target machine, right. The target machine has done nothing cryptographically to prove who it's, he is. All you know as the safe in this situation is that the target machine has your public key, right? So unfortunately, in the general use case of NKS Enterprise, a lot of people blow out the servlet as part of their standard build or something like an Active Directory uh, uh, on boot script. And so every single desktop and workstation and server in the entire enterprise has exactly the same binary on it. And that exact same binary has the exact same public keys. And it turns out that as long as this handshake goes to one of those things, it always looks the same. I mean, the random number is different, but there's no way for the client to say, I am this client. Um, later on in the, the, the handshake, there's actually a little thing where the examiner sends a package that says, oh, you're supposed to be at this IP address, right? And the guy comes back and says, yep, that's the IP address I'm at. And the, the, the servlet goes and locally looks in the register. So all that means is that this machine that it's asking thinks that it's IP address. So this hopefully takes care of maybe some in, uh, mistaken router issues, routing issues, stuff like that. Um, and it will protect you against the most simplest attack you can possibly think of here, which is just doing a TCP port forwarding with Netcat. Um, but it does open you up to a bunch of other things. Um, basically, anybody here who's ever plugged their computer into a network and it automatically works, you've used a lot of the magic fairy protocols, right? Like a magic fairy comes along and sprinkles magic fairy dust on your ethernet cable, and that magic fairy dust is DHCP, DNS, and ARP. And none of those protocols are secure, none of them use any cryptographic verification of what's in them, um, and they're all, there's lots of attacks against all of them. And so in a corporate network, in any normal corporate network, there's lots and lots of different ways of making somebody across the network think that you own the wrong IP address or the wrong DNS name. And some of the ones we outline in the paper are, what if malice just takes over an IP address? If I'm malice, and I know you're going to image Bob's workstation tonight at 3 a.m., before I leave at 10 p.m., I change my IP address and I take over Bob's IP address. And if there's a static mapping, the DNS doesn't name, right? If you're not doing like dynamic DNS updates. And Bob's computer pops a little box saying, oh, you have an IP address conflict, but Bob's not work anymore because it's 10 p.m. The image happens at 3 a.m. It goes, it does a, a static lookup. It goes and talks to my machine. My machine now has Bob's IP address, so I don't even have to do anything to the servlet. And it comes and images my machine and the examiner thinks it's Bob's is the most basic way. There's a lot more complicated ways, ARP spoofing, DHCP spoofing. I think DNS attacks are interesting. Um, if, the, if you have a situation where the examiner is using DNS names instead of IP addresses, attacking the internal DNS infrastructure is real easy. There's, I've never seen a corporate network where like, their internal dynamic DNS, which is tied to DHCP, is updated securely. Um, so as a result, basically, um, there's really no way for 
NCASE Enterprise to figure out exactly who's who. It, it is trusting that a machine has the right IP address at the right time and that DNS is working. Um, so there's arguments. I'm, I'm sure Guidance will argue this isn't a big deal, which they can have reasonable arguments that, you know, it, it's admissible to just go across and say, this somebody, somebody had an IP address, we think, and so we grab some data off of them, and so that's admissible evidence. We're not going to make any legal arguments. Chris will talk about that kind of stuff. Um, but to put forth a metaphor, right, if the old way of getting the hard drive is the police officers come to your house and they kick down the door and they put you in handcuffs, and then the forensic people come in and they bag up your computer and they take that computer to a lab, right, and that sucker's got a sticker on it, and whenever it changes hands, they sign the sticker, right, for, ch for chain of evidence, and they pull that hard drive out of the computer, they're pretty darn sure that's your computer, right? Like, unless there's somebody who specifically uh, lied somewhere in that process, there's no way for an outsider to all of a sudden make that, you know, the hard drive magically change. So in a, in a corporate environment, that would be like, if I want to go look at Bob's uh, hard drive, I walk down the stairs, go to his cube, pull his hard drive out. Right? Now obviously there's an authentication issue of is this Pop's hard drive? Is he the only person that had access to the hard drive? These things have been dealt with in the courts in the past. But in the end case enterprise situation, instead of going to Bob's cube and get the hard drive, I walk down the stairs, I go to the floor, and I look at the cube farm, and I say, who here has Bob's hard drive? And the first person who comes to me with a hard drive, I say thank you, and I put a stick it note that says Bob's hard drive on it. Right? Um, you're, you're trusting all of the people on the network not to screw around and change with Bob's hard drive. And that includes Bob. Bob could come and say, oh, this is my hard drive that you're going to examine, right? And one of the basic problems here that probably can't be solved is remote attestation. You cannot have remote attestation of the integrity of software running on a computer that is under full control of the attacker, right? This is the whole idea of TPMs and trusted computing bases. None of them work. Um, as, as you've seen from some interesting things, and even if they did work, there are no commercial operating systems that actually support integrity protect, protection using a trusted computing base. Um, and so, you know, there's two issues here. One, with the basic cryptographic design, you can frame people. But the other issue is that, as an examiner, if you think the person you're examining is, is advanced, it's not that hard for them, you know, it actually, the servlet doesn't have a lot of anti-reverse engineering protections. It would not be that hard to patch it and make it not see physical drive, drive one. It only sees physical drive zero, for example. Um, or, you know, actually probably standard root kits could be pretty easily modified um, to, to, to wipe out the, the, the sectors on disk that NCASE grabs. Uh, it uses this interesting iSCSI open up the, ro uh, uh, SCSI open up the, uh, the local hard drive kind of function that you could patch pretty easily with a root kit in the kernel. Um, so anyway, we had a couple of suggestions for guidance. Um, this is generally used in big Windows corporate networks. Those guys have Active Directory. Computers in Active Directory networks have their own identity in Kerberos. It's the name of the computer with a dollar sign. Um, you could use that to bootstrap trust. It's not perfect, but at least an attacker would have to attack AD and have the equivalent power of, an a, of a domain admin, which at that point they can plant evidence on anybody's drive anyway, right? So at least you could raise the, the, the security of here, the security of your Active Directory network. Um, and the other thing is, if you don't want, if guidance doesn't want to only support 80 supported networks, you could have servlet registration where the first time the servlet's booted, it generates a key pair, it has a hardware fingerprint, it registers itself, and whenever its IP or DNS name changes, it registers that change. This is not perfect and is attackable, but at least it would create an audit trail that would make it pretty obvious to a human being if somebody all of a sudden the last time when you do examine Bob's workstation, it, its key pair changed, right? That should be something they'd be able to trigger on and warn people about and give you an audit trail. Um, so our suggestions for EEE users, uh, the lawyer will talk in a second, um, but our, our, our suggestions is if we were using NCASE Enterprise, I think it's fine to use for initial incident response. You don't want to take servers down if you think they've been broken into, but you're not sure about it. Um, I think it's great for initial investigations, for phishing expeditions, to look through stuff. Um, and especially if you're looking at the hard drive of your non-geeks, right? You're, unlikely your marketing department is going to be patching uh, nstart.sys um, in their kernel. Um, but if you are going to use NCASE Enterprise to gather evidence, I strongly suggest that you f grab the physical drive afterwards and authenticate that the data, the evidence is on the physical drive. The whole idea of MD5s with NCASE Enterprise kind of falls apart because if you if you, if you image a working machine, the, the, the hash is going to change just as data accesses change things like the, the access times. So you have to authenticate the individual files, right? Yes, this email was on there. Yes, this PDF was on there. Um, if you're going to do court testimony, do it based upon a physical image uh, that you gathered. Be careful investigating your system administrators or any of your geeks that have the ability maybe to manipulate NCASE Enterprise either on a network layer or by patching the kernel. Um, and you probably want to keep that physical hard drive forever. Um, if you must only use uh, NCASE Enterprise, you need to uh, 
authenticate that the drive belongs to that person through other means, right? Look at what its system ID is, pull its Kerberos key out of it and compare it to what the domain server has. That kind of stuff is, is, is critical so that you don't get tricked into grabbing a hard drive that doesn't actually belong to that person. Um, so our conclusions, and we'll have Chris Ritter speak for a couple minutes in just a second, but our conclusions are, um, we, we don't really think forensic software vendors are paranoid enough. Um, they're not paranoid like Microsoft's paranoid or Oracle's paranoid. Um, and so I think a lot of work needs to go into kind of secure coding, uh, defensive coding, um, and doing things like making the product protect against buffer overflows. The fact that NCASE uses the Aladdin e-token turns off DEP protection, does a virtual protect X and it's the entire memory space. And so there's no buffer overflow protection, either stack protection or NX bit protection over the entire memory space because of that dongle. Um, and that's the kind of thing that needs to be looked at. Um, if you buy forensic software, you need to use security as an acceptance criteria. The government does lots of testing of forensic software, none of it's security testing. It's all, does this thing image correctly? Right, that kind of stuff. Does it generate MD5 sum? It doesn't ask, oh, well, now can something load up into my kernel? Um, and we think that those testing, those methods need to be public. They need to be negative QA, not just positive QA, like it's going on right now. And the acquisition of system images over a corporate network is inherently dangerous. It sounds like we're beating up on guidance. We're just looking at them because they're the industry leader. There are other products that claim to do this, and we're sure that they have the same kind of issues. It's an inherently dangerous thing to do. If you can, kick somebody's door down and get the hard drive. Um, or knock nicely, I don't know. But um, the inherently dangerous to go grab system images that way. Okay, so we'd like to thank these guys. And uh, up next, when we were doing this research, we were kind of thinking, what would security flaws mean for forensic software evidence? And so we called the EFF, and we called Jennifer Granick, and they both pointed to the same person. And that person is Chris Ritter, a uh, residential fellow of the Sanford Law School, who will talk just real briefly about uh, this, uh, how courts deal with forensic evidence and might deal with security flaws in it. So, thank you. All right, so I looked at some of the, uh, the legal implications of, of this work and, and work like it that, that demonstrates there might be vulnerabilities in the software. And the, the real lever, lever here is how likely is it that some sort of compromise happened to your system? Is it enough to just be a criminal defendant and say, oh yeah, my system was tampered with, with nothing? Well, probably not, but um, you know, I, I think the likelihood is an important issue. But I'm going to review a few different doctrines that are, that are relevant. Uh, authenticity, you need to put evidence in court only if it's authentic. Something called the best evidence rule and reliability. And, uh, but yeah, the likelihood of malicious conduct occurring is always going to be a lever in those. Um, so, and there's, there's two sort of things. There's data hiding attacks and the possibility of malicious code execution or tampering with the evidence. Data hiding is less of a problem from an evidentiary perspective. Uh, first of all, if it stays hidden, nobody's going to know about it. But also, uh, incompleteness is not something courts are as concerned about. If the evidence is incomplete, they have what's in front of them, and the fact that it's incomplete may go to the jury and they may weigh that as a consideration, but it's probably not going to get kicked out. Um, another sort of data hiding thing you might think about is that lawyers in both the civil and criminal context have obligations to find data that might be helpful to their opponents, but I think it's unlikely that that obligation would extend to data that's been hidden even from forensic software. It usually doesn't even extend to deleted data. Uh, so if there's a possibility evidence has been tampered with, is it authentic? And the federal rules of evidence say authentication of a document is satisfied by evidence sufficient to support a finding that the matter in question is what the proponent claims. That means if the judge thinks a jury could find it's authentic, the judge will send it to the jury. So it's not a very high bar. But you can also make these arguments to a jury who may factor that in to the weight of the evidence. Um, so one way authenticity is looked at is, or determined, one factor in authenticity is the chain of custody. Is what you're presenting in court the same as what you originally collected? To the extent you know there's been a compromise, your ability to demonstrate that is going to be eroded or eliminated. Uh, another thing you need is some sort of indication that the evidence is what it purports to be. And sometimes you have a person with knowledge. This I saw this document and I know it's correct. Uh, but sometimes you don't. 
for example, a log file that's 10,000 lines long, and line 1,274 is at issue. Um, so there's a, there's a rule of evidence for this situation. And it says you can authenticate evidence by describing a processor system used to produce a result and showing the processor system produces an accurate result. Um, so it's that accuracy. And a couple of courts have actually found that evidence that's susceptible to being altered, even with no firm evidence that there was any alteration, can be excluded. Uh, there's, there's a great one where someone pulls down evidence of boat ownership from a U.S. Coast Guard database on the web, and the court says the Internet's inherently trustworthy, untrustworthy and hackers can change it uh, and kicked it out. There's one about uh, website postings from Nazi groups, and one of the people in the case was a still skilled computer user, and the judge said, well, maybe she altered it, so he kicked it out. But that's definitely the exception. Usually courts uh, let in printouts from websites and such. So then you've got uh, the best evidence rule. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Again, that comes down to uh, you can use sort of a duplicate if it accurately reflects the original, same as authenticity. And uh, reliability, there's, uh, sort of, there's a case called Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals where the court lists a bunch of factors. And uh, some of them are whether there's been testing and, and peer review. And I think as you heard from these guys, there could be more. Uh, another factor is whether the techniques have a known error rate, and I think susceptibility to attack counts as an error, so the higher the susceptibility, the more likely you'll get evidence kicked out. Whether there are standards governing their application, there kind of are, but you know, they're a little, uh, they're variable. And whether the theories enjoy widespread acceptance, and they do right now, but I think as, you know, if more vulnerabilities come out, acceptance will, will drop. So in my, con my conclusion was that forensic tools aren't, aren't magic. They're software, and like anything else, they're subject to attack. And because they play such a critical role in our court system, lives and property are at stake, um, you know, courts need to be sensitive. Courts have denied defendants the opportunity to do their own forensic analysis, just accepting that the forensic image that the police had was good enough. And I think that is... Uh, definitely the wrong way to go. I think for finding hidden evidence or finding evidence of tampering, both sides should have an opportunity to, to look at the data. Sometimes you may not have a hard drive that was locked in a safe that you can compare to, like if the enterprise software was used. And in that case, uh, courts need to be thoughtful. And for more information, you can look at my paper. It's on uh, ISEC Partners' website. Yeah, thanks.